And if you'd open in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. As I preach this morning, I'd be grateful for prayers for my voice, if you think of it, or if you notice me starting to wander off a bit vocally. Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to be reading from verse 14 uh, through verse 30, the parable of the talents this morning, and the context of this story by Jesus is his teaching on the kingdom. You notice in the beginning of verse 25, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven will be like, and then he tells one story, and then when he gets to verse 14, he says, for it will be like, he's speaking of the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, what will it be like, how will, how will God relate to and evaluate his people? What, what is it like? How are we to understand Jesus' perspective on life? That's often what Jesus means when he says the kingdom of heaven is like. We're going to read this parable, but as we read that, I want us to remember that this is God's authoritative and transforming word, that it has power to transform our lives, to shape our feelings, to shape our thinking, and authority to control and conform our perspectives, and our behavior. Let's allow it to do that this morning. Verse 14. For it, the kingdom of heaven, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went, dug in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more and saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also he who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Uh, years ago, my wife and I enjoyed a, a somewhat obscure movie uh, that had a, a marvelous title. It was called The Magic of Ordinary Days. The Magic of Ordinary Days. It was all about this, this simple farmer who won the heart of this city girl through simple faithfulness and care for her one day at a time. It, it really was a, a beautiful testimony to the power of ordinary, consistent faithfulness and its accumulated value. It seemed to have an almost magical power as you watch the story unfold. Though in each moment and each day, his actions seemed ordinary enough. They, they weren't in themselves uh, extraordinary or unusual, but the accumulation of them was powerful and profound. 
And if I could steal a bit from that story, I would title this message, The Treasure of Daily Faithfulness. The Treasure of Daily Faithfulness. There's, there's something in this story that is it, not meant to provoke a, a frantic, anxiety-driven Christian. I just want to say that up front. The parable of the talents uh, is not meant to cause us to run out of here frantically looking for things to do. This is intended to describe a lifetime, a lifestyle of ordinary, determined faithfulness that has a profound accumulated value. That's the goal of the passage. I just want to say up front, look, my goal in preaching, I don't think the point of the parable, is to create frantic, anxious Christians. It is to create faithful, consistent Christians who have their eye towards the return of the Master. That's the goal. You, you remember a few weeks ago, I, I, I spoke from a similar parable. It talks about the waiting servants. Servants are called to wait for the master. And this is the kind of complement to those parables where, where this parable talks about that we're not merely waiting uh, in, in eager expectation. We're working while we wait. That part of what it means to wait for the Lord Jesus is to be at work for him using what he has given while he returns. So what I want to do this morning is, is first just walk through the story and allow its impact to be felt, allow it to, to, to kind of shape us emotionally. We want to kind of enter in to this story if we can. Now, it's a parable, and with parables, uh, the goal is not to attach uh, every single detail. It's not like this master is like God in every single detail. It's like the servants are us in every single detail. Parables work through an, an ultimate point. They're trying to deliver an ultimate uh, kind of impetus, a force upon our faith. So let's walk through the story, and then we'll spend the latter part of the message applying it to several areas of our life. We notice, first of all, in the first section here, uh, the master has this commission that is given for his servants. He's going on a journey in verse 14, and he entrusts to them, I love that word, entrusted. He entrusted to them his property. So we're very clear, this is, this is property that belongs to him. Uh, he's not giving it to them. He's, he's calling them to a stewardship, to a task of managing his wealth. And you notice also in verse 15, he gives various degrees of wealth to different servants. Five talents to one, two to another, one to a third, each according to his ability. There, there's, there's no place in this story uh, for servants who are, are jealous or sort of competing or upset that they don't get the same amount as the other servant. And partially that's because uh, the amount that is given here is frankly shocking. So we don't use the word talent, but you may have heard other messages uh, that use this denomination money. This was roughly uh, 20 years worth of salary for a common laborer. All right, that's what a talent was. So you do the math in your mind. So when, when the readers or the, maybe the audience, as they're hearing Jesus tell this story, you can see some eyebrows go up. Five talents uh, to a servant. Wow, that, this, is, this is a trusted servant. 20 years times five, that's 100 years wages. That's a serious cash has been entrusted. And, and even the guy that gets two, even the guy that gets one, 20 years wages. He, he, is a, he is a major uh, servant. He is trusted in a significant way. So you don't, you don't get the impression that there should be this, this jealousy because each of these servants is getting an overwhelming, an overwhelming stewardship, a deposit, a commission. And they're given these talents according to their ability. So one has a certain ability to manage this treasure. Another has a, a slightly lesser ability. Another has a slightly less ability. And yet again, there's, there's no sense of competition between these servants. The point is not the competition of the servants. It's the glory and the value of what the master is entrusting to them. So he commissions them with this wealth And then he leaves on this journey. He goes away. He leaves it to them to see what they will do with what they have received. What will happen to this wealth that's been deposited in these servants, that's been entrusted to them? How will they do? That's the point. That's the drama of the parable. You can feel the audience say, that's an overwhelming amount of money. What's going to happen to it while the master is away? So then we have the servant's work. What happens 
after he leaves. We have the master's commission and then the servant's work. He who had received the five talents went at once. You notice the urgency. He went at once and he traded with them. We're not told what this was, some kind of business. He traded with them and he immediately made five talents more. So he doubles his master's wealth. Again, you can feel eyebrows going up. Ten talents. He doubled his master's investment. He took what he was given and he multiplied it for the sake of his master. What a servant that would be. You could feel the crowd murmur. Wow, wow, he doubled it. He doubled the wealth given to him. And he keeps going. The one with two talents did likewise. Oh, and the murmur goes through the crowd again. He doubled it as well. Wow. What trustworthy servants? They're doubling their master's investment. There's a, there's a multiplication of what they have received. But then we hear about the third servant. He who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground. You, the, 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 the way parables work is they, they build an expectation at different moments. And you can feel first the one doubles, and then the second doubles, and the expectation of the crowd is, and then the third doubles. No. He doesn't. That's why parables work. They, they, they reveal their point through expectations that aren't met. The expectation is, well, he, he should be able to do this too. But no. No, he doesn't. He digs in the ground. He buries his master's money. You can feel the crowd, the audience, or the readers wondering, well, what's the master going to think of that? I mean, it's not... It's not bad. It's not extravagant living, is it? It's not like he, he spent it on himself. This is not the prodigal servant uh, that takes the talent and goes and wastes it in riotous living. I wonder, I wonder what the master will think of this. There's a sense of expectation that's built into the story. And then that leads to the master's return, where the judgment will be rendered. He who had received the five talents, come to this master who it says there in verse 19 is going to settle accounts with them. You can picture the master coming and calling his servants to him and saying, I, I entrusted this to you. Now what have you done with it? You, you, you can feel that the expectation was that this money was intended to be used for multiplication. There isn't a sense in this story that that was a surprise. The, the sense of the story is this is the purpose of being entrusted with this money. This wasn't intended to just be guarded. It was intended to be multiplied. It wasn't just to be kept. It was to be sown. He expected there to be a return. You also don't have in this story, and this is where, where parables are, are, are to be felt in terms of their main point. Uh, this is not a, a story about the inconsistencies of the stock market, okay? Or, or the, you don't have the, the category of the unlucky servant who did his absolute best, but the market tanked and oil prices went down. And unfortunately, he came back, I tried hard, Master, but I have now a half a talent. No, that, that's, that's not the point of the story. That's where we get in our, our uh, modern American minds. Well, he might have tried hard, and he didn't even get the... No, the, the, the point is in this parable world, if you invest, you will get a return. That's the point of this, in this parable world, it's just a story, if you invest, there is automatically a return in this story. So we have every expectation, had this servant invested the one talent, he would have gotten one talent more. That's the expectation. So there's, there's no sense of the unlucky servant that maybe he was wise, maybe it would have gotten worse. No, 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 no. The point is, if he had invested, he would have gotten one talent more. But he doesn't. And now the time comes for settling of accounts. The first servant comes and, and says to the master, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, here, I have made five talents more. You sense the joy of the master as he commends the servant. He says in verse 21, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. Again, the eyebrows go up, a little. To this master, five talents is a little? What, 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 what kind of master is this? You can feel the crowd say, what, what kind of master calls five talents a little? A hundred years' wages, a little? You get a, a sense that the reality behind this story begins to peek through at that point, doesn't it? What kind of master calls five talents a little? A really wealthy master. You've been faithful over a little. 
I will set you over much. Oh, he gets a sense of this reward. What, what's he going to be in charge of now? Five talents. And that was a little. Now much? Well, what's the much going to be? And then we have this remarkable phrase, enter into the joy of your master. It's, it's as though the servant comes into his very presence. You, you have now entered into a whole new realm of servanthood. The, the joy of the master, the joy that I have to give you will now belong to you. Because you have been faithful, because you invested what you received faithfully, now joy will be yours. Joy will be the result. And, and greater honor and prestige and responsibility even than you previously had. Joy will be yours. Joy and position beyond your imagination. It will be yours, my good and faithful servant. You notice that the second servant comes and, and says likewise. Master, Master, it says in 22, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I, I have made two more. You can feel that the question of the crowd will... What will be the reward of this servant? Perhaps the master will be a little less enthusiastic. But we get the impression that this master is, is not comparing servants. He's comparing faithfulness. He's not comparing amounts because he knows they had different abilities. He's comparing faithfulness. It's irrelevant to him, the ultimate amount, because obviously if, if five talents is a little, uh, this is all relative to this master. He's comparing faithfulness. And so the response is the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. You also have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. And look, listen to the same commendation. Enter, he says, into the joy of your master. Again, you can, you can feel the cultural eyebrows raised. What, what does that mean? There's, there's almost a, a tantalizing vagueness in the phrase, isn't it? Enter into the joy of your master. There's a sense of, of a door opening with, with a light beyond it and a golden glow and, and sounds of celebration and laughter. And we're not really allowed to peek inside, but there's this sense of that as the door opens that the servant is told, enter into the joy of your master. Almost as though the, the Lord conceals a bit of what that joy is so that we can have the ultimate anticipation. Enter the joy of your master. And then we have this sort of anti-climax here as the third master comes. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Now, the, the word know here, master, I knew, and then when the master repeats it, you knew me to be, I, I think it is, it is basically ironic it's basically an ironic use of the word no, because we know, because we've read the parable, that this is not who this master is. And again, you're not supposed to assume, well, behind this story, there's like another story where he's this really cruel individual. No, no, you're supposed to take what the parable has told us about him. So when the, when the servant says, I know that you reap where you don't sow, we're to say, no, no, he isn't. All of these things came from him. He's reaping exactly what he did sow. He didn't reap what he didn't sow. So automatically we're to say that this servant uh, it has a wrong view of the master. He thinks of him as a hard man, when in fact he's, he's a very generous, entrusting master. He gave him a whole talent, 20 years wages, to invest and to steward. So right off the bat we have something is wrong with this servant's view of the master. He was afraid, he says. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here. You have what is yours. You have the sense that this servant uh, essentially was trying to play a, a zero-sum game. He, he's basically saying, look, look, I'm not going to waste it, but I'm not going to invest it either. What has he been doing all this time the master's been gone? That's the point. Nothing. Nothing. He, he hasn't done anything particularly evil in the sense of wasting the money, but he hasn't done anything particularly good either. And the verdict of the master is scathing in verse 26. You wicked and slothful servant. The master is very clear. He knows who he is. <laughs> I'm not a hard, I'm not a hard, unkind master. I gave you a talent to invest. That was the expectation. And even the master says, what you claim to know, quote unquote, this knowledge of me as a hard master 
even that speaks against you. Even what you say you knew speaks against you. Because even in that case, you would have at least taken it to the bank and gotten some interest. Let somebody else use it at some level. You literally buried it in a shallow grave and did nothing with it. But what's happening? You say, look, even, even your, even your self-defense is pathetic. What's he doing? He's, he's penetrating to the heart. What was really going on with this servant? Uh, he, he was afraid, yes. He was afraid of investing for this master. He was wicked. He was lazy. He did not want to have to work for the master. And so he makes up an excuse and says, well, really, it's your fault. Really, it's your fault because you're hard. And, and you gather what you don't sow. You, you steal. You're, you're a thief. It's your fault. And the master says, no. Even if that were the case, you would have done something out of sheer terror. The real issue here is you are wicked and lazy. And you did not do what I entrusted to you to do. So take the talent, he says, from him. Give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, and I think the point of the having there is those who have produced, the one who has 10 talents, it's not like, it's not like he started with, with money. He started with his master giving him this money to steward, and then what he has is what he has done with that money that he stewarded. He multiplied what he received. So the one who has, yes, he, he will be given in abundance, it's, it's sort of a repetition of, of what was said earlier, the joy of your master, that, that door that's open and the sense of treasure and joy beyond it, beyond imagination. More, more will be given to the one who has, even more than he could imagine in abundance. But from the one who has not, in other words, who has not multiplied anything, even what he has, even what he was given to invest will be taken away from him. Even what he could have stewarded, even that will be taken away. He has spent all this time having and doing nothing. And in the end, even what he has will be taken away. Even what he was given will be taken away from him. He won't even have that anymore. And he will be cast, Jesus says, into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, he, he will no longer even be counted a servant. The true nature of his heart and disposition will be revealed. He will be stripped of his position. He will be stripped of his possessions. He will be stripped of his stewardship. He will be cast out, and he will then weep and gnash his teeth in agony, recognizing he is forever outside the glow of the master's joy. If the true servant is invited into this, this doorway with this golden glow, the joy of your master, the false servant is, is stripped of his credentials and cast outside and said, you, you wicked, worthless servant, you, you, you did nothing with what I entrusted to you. Now, what is the point of this? If you... If you read this story, man, the goal is to, to, to build towards an ultimate point. Jesus is such a, a master teacher. He uses these stories, and you, can, you feel the emotional effect of them. What's the charge, you think, at the end of this story? How, how would you write it? I, I wrote it this way. Fulfill the priceless calling you have received. Fulfill the priceless calling you have received. Jesus is speaking to self-professed servants of the ultimate master, and he's saying, fulfill the priceless calling you have received. The servants who fulfill their priceless calling will receive their master's joy. The servants who fulfill it, who, who multiply it, who bring it to fruition, who do with it what the, the Lord intended for them to do, they will receive their master's joy. That, that, that's the point of this story. It's intended to impress on us something even more profound when we consider who our master is. Now, as, as fabulous as, as this master was, ultimately this story falls short in revealing the ultimate master. 
Because Jesus is, is sitting there and he's telling this story to his disciples and to the crowd, perhaps listening to him. But, but what are we aware of? Our master is not just fabulously wealthy. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. The, the, the power of the story only amplifies when you meditate on who is our master and what have we been given. I mean, this is powerful enough just for an ordinary servant. I mean, if this was like a, in the servant's handbook uh, for Galilee, uh, this would be a powerful story. Boy, serve your master. Don't be a worthless servant, right? And this would be a, a powerful kind of normal service morality kind of message. But this is even more profound. We think about our master is the Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, Twenty talents is, is nothing to him. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the universe. He owns the stars. He is the ultimate master. It's it's profound when we think about this master's departure. He didn't just go away on a journey. He, he, He went away by way of the cross to pay for his servants. All was not well. In our scenario, in this scenario, just a master going on a journey. In our scenario, the master leaves by way of Calvary and purchasing the redemption of these servants and paying for their sins and claiming them out of servitude to the evil master and bringing them into his own possession. This master would would hang on a cross and die for these very servants. He, He would be crushed in their place. He would would take on himself all of their wrongdoing, all of their failures, all of their lazy wickedness. He would take on himself that that's our master. And so the one speaking is all the more glorious and worthy of saying, fulfill the priceless calling you have received. And it's even more profound because the joy, that, that open door that the master beckons us towards. It's not just some palatial location on earth. It's the glory of his paradise in the new heavens and the new earth where he says, enter into your master's joy. The joy of of seeing Jesus Christ face to face. The joy of of ultimate and infinite glory. Of of seeing the glory of the Father. Of seeing His his holy surroundings. Of of seeing His people. A myriad of of myriads worshiping Him. That's where where Jesus is saying, look, the joy that is set before you is beyond imagination. You can can just see the the door cracked open now and the the glory shining out of it. He says, come and enter into the joy of the master. Wait till the day you hear from this master. Well done, good and faithful servant. What What a glorious invitation and what a sober warning. The outer darkness of this ultimate master, it's not just being thrown out into the street. You have to go find some new work. No, this is the outer darkness of eternity. That's you can, again, see the reality peering through the parable when Jesus references in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can see Jesus isn't just talking about, you know, being thrown out into the street. You're going to have to find some other work. You, You might have to look for a new master. He's saying, no, this, this is an ultimate outcast away from the light of God's presence, out into the darkness of God's wrath, facing the pain and, and shame and guilt permanently of having neglected service to this master. The, the power of this parable is seen when we remember who the master really is what he did in departing on this journey, and who he is when he returns, the Lord of heaven and earth. And that master says to any who would be his professed servants, fulfill. Fulfill the priceless calling you have received. (coughs) Fulfill it. Multiply it. Consider the treasured responsibility I have given to you. 
Are we called to wait eagerly for the Lord's return? Yes, we are. What does that waiting look like? It looks like doing the good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do we do them out of just some moral obligation? No, we do them because of our view of who our master is and what he did in departing by way of the cross of our redemption. How do we apply this? Let me give three categories three categories, three times in our life that we can fulfill our calling. We are called as servants of the Lord. He has entrusted to us a holy calling, a deposit of gifts and time and opportunities and purpose that must not be wasted or buried, but multiplied in day-by-day service to the Lord of our regular lives. Again, I'm not talking about some frantic, anxious Christian racing around looking for some new action to do. I'm talking about faithful, consistent, regular investment of who God has made us to be and the opportunities he has given to us that has this accumulated, treasured value at the end of our days. All right, three categories. First of all, our free time. Oh, I was convicted by this category as I was reading this parable to myself and just allowing the effect of it to shape me. I thought, oh, I don't want to be like that professing servant who has the, the, the claim and the credentials of being a servant, but at the end of the day, what's he do? He buries what he has been given into a shallow grave and just waits on the master's return. Or worse, blaming the master for his own inactivity. Our free time. Now, of course, I know as you do, the Bible has nothing against rest or even relaxation and joy in God's creativity expressed through people. Things like movies and TV and reading for fun and social media. They may, in certain moments, be the best investment of our time. They may. That's a very important caveat. They they may. God created a real world with real people and real joys that can be celebrated and enjoyed. And and we're not to have this this ascetic view of God that he's he's after sobriety all the time and a a lack of, of joy and mirth and gladness. No, that's not the case. That's not who the Lord is. However, often, often, for me, free time is more like Burying treasure in a shallow grave. The treasure of moments and the high calling of belonging to Jesus in a shallow grave of superficial indulgence. It's not always the case that the things that are buried or that are done are are evil or explicitly wicked. It's just that those moments are are not used to higher purpose. Isn't that the point of this parable? Don't you love the wisdom of Jesus? He doesn't describe the prodigal servant. He doesn't say that. It's not riotous living. He describes simply a buried talent in a shallow grave. And often my free time is like that, buried talent in a shallow grave. Isn't your free time like that? Sometimes nothing wrong with some free time and enjoying and rest and and, and pleasure and those kinds of things. But, But often, often it crosses the line from appropriate enjoyment of God's gifts into the indulgence of superficial things and the lack of investing in better things. Isn't it easy to evaluate your life? I'm evaluating my life when you think about entertainment or media use and Is that time all meant to be spent in that way? Or would it be better spent in serving or loving or praying or producing? I I think sometimes my free time is actually not free. It's costing me some of what I could return to the Lord on that day. It's not actually free time, but the person it's costing is me. Because I want on that day to return an accumulation of faithful, ordinary moments of service and prayer and reading and value to him because of what he's given, the high calling that he's given to me 
in moments and opportunities and gifts and, and knowledge and the ability to pursue godly things. John Piper has, has said, I'll paraphrase this, but he says, we're, we're the first generation that's in danger of amusing ourselves to death. And I, I think that's true. We amuse ourselves. Oh, that's amusing, and that's amusing. and that's, we're, we're like the child that goes to the carnival and just can't enjoy any one thing because they're running to the next thing. Oh, there's a headline, there's a headline, there's a headline, there's a headline. But there's, let, let's, let's be sober in our evaluation of our heart in our free time. And I, I'm saying this, I, I, if self-evaluating. Is my heart in my free time evaluating the cost? Am I evaluating the cost of that 10 minutes, that 20 minutes, that hour, that two hours, that eight hours a week, 12 hours a week? Am I evaluating that cost? Because we are called as servants not just to neglect evil, but to do good. To do good in the sight of God. To do good that, that honors him, that, that, that bears heavenly fruit. A, a heavenly return. And if I can't confidently say this, this moment of free time is producing a heavenly return, then, then I should not be doing it. And again, don't be super spiritual. Some ordinary moments of relaxation and entertainment can produce a heavenly return of, of celebrating God's kindness and goodness and creativity. Yes, they can. But at a certain moment, they could be burying treasure in a shallow grave. Let me encourage us to evaluate our lives. Look, the, the word is meant to shape us. We are not meant to listen and nod and affirm and walk away unchanged. We're meant to listen and receive and humble ourselves and acknowledge that our lives must change in response to the word. Our free time. Secondly, our fast time. Our fast time. I used all F words because that's what preachers do. Our fast time. Uh, now, many men wiser than me have made the point that busyness is not equal to godliness. We must not be deceived. Just because we're moving quickly does not mean we are investing wisely. You would know that in, in, the, in the stock market. Uh, just because someone has a lot of, of transactions doesn't mean their wealth is growing. Hey, I had 98 transactions today. Who cares? The point is, did your wealth grow? The same thing is true spiritually. The number of transactions doesn't necessarily mean that we're investing wisely. Don't, don't equate busyness with godliness. Sometimes busyness is a way of avoiding doing the most important things. So we should be earnest and eager and at work, but at work doing the best things. So if you're one of those people that, I just like producing. I like producing. I like working. I don't like sitting still. Look, don't, don't think this passage is about everybody else and not you. You could be busy doing the wrong things. We, we don't know what the servant did. It wasn't uh, his, his sitting around that made him slothful. It was his not doing anything with that treasure. You can be a slothful servant that is exhausted because of how busy you are. For one thing, if we are never still before the Lord then it is hard to see how we are obeying the Lord's command to be still and know that he is God or fulfilling his character as the shepherd that leads us by quiet streams. For another, sometimes we're busy doing the things that are easier to do so we don't have to do the things that are harder to do. Workaholics are not more faithful. They're just less willing to do the hard work of resting. Or they might rather make money than make disciples of their children. Or they might rather fix their yard then fix the romance in their marriage. It is the Lord's calling that we are, we are called to invest, not the busyness of our schedule, but the fullness of our investment in his kingdom. I'd like to see us sit down and ponder whether in all of our busyness we are doing the best things, or whether we're just putting a, a fresh coat of paint on a rotten beam in a house. Third, I'm actually going to do four. Third, our family time. Our family time. If our time on this earth is limited, our time with our children is even more limited. 
Often we are content with children just not interrupting us. But actually, we are called to be interrupting them with training in the ways of the Lord. Give, give you a category. Where, where I, I'm often most convicted is that my training of my children is often confined to moments of correcting them. Now, I'm called to correct them. But if our training and our speaking about God is limited to moments when we are correcting them, th- their view of God is going to be shaped by that context. That God is mostly a God who is determined to fix their wrong behavior rather than one who is worthy of their adoration and their study. Is our family time seasoned with the investment of our calling as servants of the master where his word and his presence are present among us? Our family time. Are Are we investing in family time? Are we in, this doesn't require uh, some brilliant ability, all right? And there might be five talent dads among us. I am not one of them. Like five talent dads. Man, everything they, they come up with this discipleship plan and it's published next year. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and they come up with this great memorization product and everybody in the church says, can I get that from you? That's amazing. And they create an app for training their children. And look, you don't have to be a five talent dad. But take your one talent and invest it. Look, if we can read the Bible... Or listen to it read, if your wife's a better reader than you, get her to read it. If you can have the Bible read in your home, and you can take a few minutes of prayer, then you can seize moments to invest. One pastor, a book that I would highly recommend called A Neglected Grace, A Neglected Grace, uh, he, he, he says that in the old days, our spiritual parents had what they called the family altar, that two or three times a day they would, they would gather to read and pray. And he compares that to today where it might be difficult to find a family praying or, or reading together once a week, possibly. Look, these are, it's not like what we're doing in those moments is evil, but Jesus does call the servant wicked and slothful. Not because he was doing evil things, but because he wasn't investing in the best things. The talent of treasure he was given, and consider what we have been given, the knowledge of the Son of God. The the, the knowledge that God's word is his authority on this earth. The knowledge that when we pray to him, he hears us. The knowledge that there is a future and a home for those who will follow God. The knowledge that in our weakness and weariness, we can turn to him for strength. That, That knowledge is a priceless treasure that we can invest in our families. Finally, our full time. Our full time Jobs. I, I want to seize a few final moments to address our full-time work because I think it's possible, very possible, probable even, that we can disconnect our full-time work from our faith. And I do not think that Jesus intends this parable to only apply to everything we're doing less than our full-time work. Uh, sometimes I think that flows from uh, the old Gnostic heresy that I think is, is present even today in the church, this idea that there is this, this uh, spirituality that is really what God is interested in, and the body doesn't really have anything uh, significant to say about God. But th- that is not the case. We believe in a God who made heaven and earth, who made the body and the soul, and who intends them be t- to be together. We are embodied creatures, that are are meant to do physical things and work in this creation. Even in the new heavens and new earth, we will have physical work to do to the glory of God and without pain like we have here. But, But stuff we do physically is intended by God as investment for his glory. Our full time work is meant to be offered to the Lord as a return on his investment to us. It's crucial that we ascribe uh, to God the glory for what we are doing full time. Every worthwhile job on this earth, I'm not talking about explicitly sinful work, okay? But every worthwhile job on this earth can be traced back to some element in the image of God in us or to God's desire to do good to our fellow creatures. Every element. Luther said that our work 
assuming it is upright work, is really God working through us. So what's one way you can invest in your full time? For example, an appliance technician is really God's employee, providing physical comfort and efficiency and showing the capacity of his creation to human beings. It's God's money that's coming in that direct deposit at the end of the day. It's not GE's money or Whirlpool's money. It's God's money. An engineer is really just exploring and utilizing God's wisdom in designing this world and providing the benefits of God's order to those who benefit from their work and business. You're really just reflecting the image of God in order and giving that benefit to others. You're God's employee. A financial manager is serving God by helping people develop their gifts and new business or worthwhile endeavors that do good to people in a thousand ways. A mother caring for her children is really God caring for those children through her. The providing of clean clothes and a safe home environment or an education is really God clothing and protecting and training his creatures. The fast food worker or grocery worker is feeding human beings, being God's delivery system to those who need food and enjoy food as a pleasure of God's creation. God is not some Tibetan monk seeking to live separate from the world and hoping his people will too. No, our work, our full-time work, your full-time work in our attitude, our disposition, our conscious sense of being in the presence of God, it is offered to God as part of our investment. Look, you will not get to heaven and God's only going to ask you about your free time. He's not only going to ask you about your, your, your family time, what you did on vacation. He's going to ask you about your full-time work. It's okay to think of that as serving the Lord. That's actually precisely what Paul says in Colossians and Ephesians, that look, ultimately, you are serving the Lord in how you do your work. So, so, so those of you who go to work, look, you're, you're going to work for the Lord. You're, you're being used by him to provide common grace blessings in his creation to explain things and provide things and create things and, 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 and protect things and, and do any number, all the things that you do as members of this church. God is using you to provide the same kind of common grace that is present in the sun that shines on the just and the unjust and the rain that falls on the wicked and the righteous. He is providing that kind of good. If, if, you're, if you're a lawyer, you're providing the benefit of legal help to those who need it in a civilization which, by the way, God created. If, if you're a mother and your full-time work is at home, you, you, you are representing God in raising up the next generation. And not just when you're training them in the Bible, when you are diapering them and clothing them and protecting them and, and wiping sunscreen on their little pale faces. What are you doing? You are being used of God to guard and protect them in the way that he does. Your full-time work is the most things that, that, that's most of what you do in your waking hours. It's right to view that by faith as an offering you are giving to the Lord. It, it doesn't have to be that the only way you're investing in the service of the Lord is if you're a missionary or a pastor. No, that is not the case. I'm studying for a message on Tuesday afternoon, and, and, and you're analyzing a data spreadsheet, and we are both of us serving the master. The point is, Christians do this consciously as an offering to the Lord. Non-Christians do it unwittingly, because they're aware if I don't eat, I want to eat, I have to work, it's just part of life. If I want to have an iPad, I have to work, you know rather have an iPad or eat, I'm not sure, but I want one of those things, and I have to work to get those things. But the Christian does it in conscious faith, willingly, so that at that last day, what, what do we do? We come as those, hopefully, first or second servants saying, look, 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 Lord, you gave me time, you gave me faith, you gave me the desire to do this for you, and, and look, look at these years, look at, look at these years of serving you. Now, if we go to work without any conscious awareness of doing this for the Lord or any desire to do this for any godly motive, well, then no, I don't think we're investing in the same way. If we're doing it in the same way that non-Christians do it, where it's just 
drudgery or something we have to do or we complain about all the time. Well, no, you can't offer a complaining drudgery offering to the Lord as if that's investment in his kingdom. But you can offer faith and work done with eager desire to serve God and serve his creation. And on that last day, we're, we're going to come to the Lord and say, look, look, Lord. Look, look, you, you, gave me, you, you gave me half a talent because I, you know, I, I, I have lower abilities but look, look, I, I've gained half a talent more. One day at a time. One month at a time. One year at a time. You know what we'll hear on that day? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And that door will swing wide. And all those moments of faithfulness will will, will give way to the light of his presence. The crucified one, now risen, will welcome us in with a beam of his smile. We'll hear the applause of our fellow witnesses. We will lay our accumulated faithfulness that all started with his gift of grace down at his feet. Receive it. Master, it is yours, and I give it back to you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love the idea of revealing through our good works the grace that you have given to us. Lord, thank you that you save us by grace and grace alone, that our work does not save us, it just reveals your grace in us. All that we have, Lord, we have received. Lord, I pray that you would give us strength to do our work this week with faith. Lord, to give you the moments of spreadsheets and diapers and lawn care and reaching out to the neighbor and family devotions, and personal devotions. But I pray you give us strength to turn away from shallow things that bury your time and your calling in the superficial. But I pray you give us a serious-minded joy that lives life working hard for your return. Thank you for the privilege of being your servants. In Jesus' name, amen.